Good evening. This special meeting of the Judson Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 6.30 p.m. I'm very pleased that you've taken time to join us this evening. We want to extend to each of you a sincere welcome from the entire school board. Thank you for your interest in Judson ISD. We've established a quorum and I will call roll. Ms. Eaton. Present. Ms. Pichel. Here. Mr. Macias. Present and welcome. Ms. Knoyer. Present. Mr. LaFoyle. Present and welcome. And I'm Melinda Salinas. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And to my left, we have our superintendent of schools, Dr. Carl Montoya. Present. We will move on to item number two, discussion item and report 2A, fiscal year 2019 budget preparation discussion. Members of the board, uh, again, this is kind of an ongoing process to share the most current information we have at this point. And obviously we want to pass the budget towards the end of June so that we can move forward for next year. But at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Alessandro. Thank you, Dr. Montoya. Good evening, board members. Um, tonight, we're going to try to give you a, a brief update as to where we are in the process with the budget. As you all know, we've had numerous meetings, and I just wanted to con continue to update you all as to where we were so we, you all can see where we're kind of moving forward on the budget process for next school year. The first uh, thing we're going to be talking about is going to be the general, or the first fund is the general operating fund. And of course, this is the fund, just as a reminder, that op where we pay most of our expenditures from. Um, so we'll be spending the most amount of time on this particular um, fund, the discussion on this fund. So our estimated taxable values that we're using for next year, based on the latest estimates that the appraisal district has provided for us, is about $9.3 billion. Last year it was $8.8 .8 billion. So you can see there's a significant increase there. And that's a good thing and I'll, why there's an increase, and I'll explain that to you in a, in a moment. The tax collection rate when we had our own tax office was at approximately at 98 percent based for current collections. And so far, we're, uh, Mr. Odessi's office is on track to do the same thing, to, to keep that tax rate, uh, collection rate. So I'm happy to hear that or see that because I was a little concerned as to what was going to happen. And so they're doing really well. So I'm glad that uh, that's being, they're able to maintain that. The ADA that we're using for next school year at this time is 21,305 students, uh, which is the same one that we had last school year. Um, that was the final number for last school year. We don't have the final numbers for this year yet, and we won't have them until the end of school, until June. And around the 15th or 16th, we'll have final numbers for this current year, and then I'll, at that time, determine if we need to update that estimated ADA. It may go up a little bit, but it's not going to be significant because, as you all know, we're barely maintaining the number of um, enrollment, the enrollment that we've had in the past. Our attendance rate that I use for our calculation for the budget is at 94.6%, and that is about the number that we're achieving as far as actual attendance. The tax rate at the bottom there is $1.04 per 100. Um, that's what it has been for a number of years, and we're, we are not proposing any kind of increase uh, at this time. It's still going to be $1.04 uh, per 100 for, uh, for next school year. And, uh, and obviously, I'm sorry to go back a second. And obviously, just as a reminder, we cannot increase that tax rate um, from that number unless we go out to the voters and get approval through a tax ratification election. The most we can increase it to is a dollar and 17, so you can go up 13 cents, um, just to kind of keep that in your mind for future reference. So on the local revenue side, we break this up really into local revenue, state revenue, federal revenue, and some other sources. But the local revenue is where we, where we show the tax collections, and it's in that very first uh, row where it shows what it was last year, about 90.5 million, or current year. And next year, we're estimating the 95.4 million. And that's when I showed, said a minute ago, it's a good thing that we had a property uh, value increase because it's allowing us to gain about another $4.9 million with the same tax rate that we currently have, which is that dollar and four. On this slide, the, re the revenues are pretty much the same until you get to the investment interest, where it was $50,000 for 17-18, and we put it at 550,000 for 18-19. Um, this, this is occurring because of the higher interests that are being paid to us on our investments and the banks. As you all know, interest rates are increasing. Um, at one time when the interest rates were a lot nicer in the 6 and 7 percent, we used to have almost $2.5 million in that line item. So slowly, we think it's going to continue to increase, which will obviously help us. That's the only increase or change in this those two items in this, on this particular slide for local revenues. On the state revenue side, I'm sorry, if you have questions, please interrupt me as we're going through. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Elizondo. So I would like to ask you on that line that says athletics. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's the 
what does that include? Is that like, is that tickets? That, yes, okay. that, that are the, those are the ticket sales for all of our athletic events, whether it's football, soccer, uh, basketball, everything that we do. Oh. Yes. Um, state revenue, um, this is the, the second largest funding source. Local is the largest funding source for our district. But state is the second uh, largest funding source for our school district. And the majority of this is based on, again, ADA, how many students are in our, in our classroom every day during the instructional uh, school year. And it's that very first line item, as you can see, you know, we, it's about $109 million that we receive from there. But they adjusted a little bit further down when you see the number in brackets that shows $89 million. But there's some other programs in there you'll see that give us additional money for special ed, career and tech, gifted and talented. And those are all based on different formulas. Typically, it's how many hours do those kids spend in the classroom or, and, and like special ed is weighted for students that are in particular kinds of uh, environments that are taught, you know, that require a, a, a smaller student to teacher ratio. So it's more expensive to teach them so the state gives us a little bit more money for those students. Um, Comp Ed is also, uh, in our district, a large, as you can tell, funding uh, source. And that has to do with the way that they do that is they look at the number of students that are, are on our free and reduced lunch applications and go through their formulas and estimate how much they should provide for us in that. And so that where the, that's how they derive at the $18 million. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. So the large number at the bottom there um, is $8.7 million for TRS on behalf. Just as a reminder, you're going to see that on the revenue side. You'll see it on the expense side in a little while. That's just an accounting uh, pension requirement that we have to do. So you'll kind of see that's not really money that we're receiving, but it is something we have to record on the books. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is on the line of career and technology allotment. Mm -hmm. We have, you said that we have more money there. Does that have to do with the number of students? Yes, it has to do with how many students we have in the program, how many hours they spend in the classroom. And there's also a, a coherent sequence of like, if you will, like if you take class, you know, one and then class two and class three in the correct sequence, then you get additional funding for that as well. And so that's all indicated in that number. Okay. And the second question is on transportation. Sure. Is that due to we're needing more buses uh, because we're going to be opening new schools? Or what is Sure. That $2.6 million that I'm using for 18-19 mm -hmm. is actually the final number. When you look at the 17-18 budget, those are all the original numbers that we use because we always compare original to original. In 17-18, their final number that they, once the reports were submitted to the state, we're actually going to get $2.6 million as well in 17-18. So I use the same number for the next year because we won't know exactly how much it is until all the reports are submitted to TA, and those don't happen until after the audits are done and what have you. But it is based on the number of routes that our uh, okay. buses run. So if we increase routes, then as long as they're eligible routes, in other words, they have to be further than the two mile radius or they have to be in a, right. in a hazardous area that we've, that we've decided so that we can be eligible for the, for the funding from the state. Yes, yes ma'am. So total revenue from the state at the bottom there uh, for this 18-19 school year, we're projecting about $84.2 million. And if you look to the column right next to it where it shows a negative $5.9 million in brackets, this is, I just want to talk about this for a minute because this is really important. Had our taxable values not increased this year and had uh, it stayed the same, you know, no increase at all, then what would happen is when we were talking about the property taxes on the first slide, there would have been no increase there. It would have been exactly what you had the prior year, dollar four tax rate, same property values. But here you would have lost still $5.9 million because the state is always one year behind with the values that they use for your property taxes, uh, for, your proper, for your values. So it's just important to know that because if for some reason or when, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, if the funding structure stays the same, that the appraisal district doesn't have as a significant increase, even if they just increase 1%, you're still going to lose a bunch of money from the state that year, and you're not going to be able to recapture it from local taxes. So this year, we lost $5.9 million from the state, and we recaptured $4.9 million. So we had a, a net loss of about a $1 million. Um, so just always keep that in the back of your mind, because that becomes a very important number that when I see or when we talk about school districts that get in trouble fin uh, financially or fiscally because of their funding, this is where they mess up. They forget that that's going to catch up with them. Our neighboring district is going to be in, well, they're going to have to ask their voters to increase. But so since we're not right now, are you saying that this is something that we need to think about in possibly the immediate future? The tax rate? Uh, yes, tax rate increase? Definitely. The only reason that we are not doing that this year is because 
we have some insurance proceeds that are going to, they're the money from the hail damage from the hailstorm that are going to help us for this particular year. Because if not, we would have, uh, well, we would have had to have said either we're going to have to cut a lot of programs or we're going to have to go to the voters and ask them to uh, authorize a higher tax rate. And we would have been doing that right now, going out to the voters and pr making presentations and everything because if it wouldn't have been for that hail damage, we would have been, and I'll show you a slide in a moment where we would have ended up, which would have been a not, it would not, I don't think it would have been acceptable to any of us to adopt a budget at that level. So I'll move forward a little bit and we'll kind of talk about that again. The next slide is uh, the federal revenue, which is another one of our larger components that we receive money from. It's not a lot. It's pretty, pretty uh, static compared to last year. Uh, actually, it's the same amount as last year. And then other resources. This is where we have like one-time things that happen. In this particular case, you know, we had lent that uh, money to the construction fund for the Veterans Memorial High School Phase One, that $4.4 million. And when the voters approved the bonds to be sold this time around, we asked them to ask, have the ability to reimburse ourselves for that, and the voters approved it. So we were able to, in 1718, give us that $4.4 million back. But that was a one-time thing. So in 1819, that's not available anymore. So we're going to lose that for that one-time um, item. On the expenditure side, um, what happens here is in the salaries, uh, we look at what we have budgeted for payroll currently, because that's the start, our starting number, if you will, for the salaries and benefits. So it's our payroll, including all the insurance and everything else that we do with employees. And then the second line, which we're going to talk about more in just a moment, there's a, several slides that are going to uh, identify where that $1.5 million is coming from. And I'll just tell you right now, just kind of as a as a start, it has to do with the opening of the new elementary schools and Veterans Memorial High School, adding the, the next grade level, as well as some cuts to some positions that we're uh, proposing, as, and it's a net effect of those two amounts. So, we'll, But we'll talk about it in more detail in just a moment. On the next one where it says salary um, increase and adjustments, what we're looking at there is, I've mentioned to you that one of the things that ha helped us in the past was our workers' compensation program, and I'm going to identify that a little bit different to show that it's a workers' comp program. The, that last time we did this, we actually, because there's a lot of, re we're self-funded self for workers' comp. So anytime that one of our employees becomes injured, we send them to the clinics and we pay for their procedures and what have you, and we're, we have a fund to pay for that. We, every time somebody gets paid, we take a little bit of money and we have a, a rate that we, uh, uh, that we, calculate against the money we're paying them, and we set that aside in a reserve, if you will, in a little savings account for any workers' comp claims. Well, we have a very nice reserve set up for our school district, and about four or five years ago, we actually stopped contributing to it for a few years when we were having a lot of budget issues as well, when the state stopped funding us. And it, it's about a million dollars a year is what it costs us to do that, and so what we're proposing right now is not cutting it 100 percent, but cutting it uh, by half, so that we're still going to be contributing some money to that fund. Next school year, you know, depending on what happens, you know, whoever's here may have to decide, okay, do we have to cut all of it or what, you know, or can we reinstate it? This is not something that can be, can continue on indefinitely, but you can do it for a few years and still be okay. Um, in that fund right now, there's about seven, a little over $7 million in the reserves. And so on an annual basis, we uh, spend approximately 700 something, a little over $700,000. So there's money there to carry us through. But however, for some reason, we had some significant injuries with our employees, and I mean, it could very easily affect that fund. So it's something you have to monitor very closely to make sure we don't get in trouble with it. Um, so in total here, uh, the, the other, so in total salaries and benefits, we're looking at about $159 million for next school year. And the line item right beneath it is the operating cost for the district, our campuses and our departments, and we're gonna talk about that $29 million in detail in a moment, where we show you a listing of every department and every campus and how much money they're spending that equates to that $29 million. And then the TRS on behalf is that offset that I mentioned earlier, what's the expense side of that. So altogether for those categories, it's $37.9 million for the operating costs and TRS on behalf. Questions, I'm gonna keep going. Oh, keep doing that the other way. So the general operating fund, when we look at it as a whole, our revenue is 187, or we're projecting 187.3, um, million dollars for next school year, and on the expense side, 197.4 million. If we, just, if we stop there, you would see that we would have a deficit of about $10 million. And this is, a number, this is where I said a minute ago, that, that would not be acceptable to any of us because that is just, you can't take our fund balance and hit it by that much in one year or you're gonna be in trouble real fast. And to cut $10 million worth of expenditures, 
is very, very difficult. Um, we were, we're having a hard time when we identified the two million that we're sharing, gonna share with you in a little bit uh, in more detail. But so to cut that kind of money, you would really, I mean, it would, you, would, you would have to cut instructional programs. You would have to cut a lot of things that we, you know, we definitely don't want to cut because it would definitely affect the level of education that our students would receive. But a little bit uh, below that, you see that there's some fund balance uses. uses. So we have um, our regular fund balance, which we call our unassigned fund balance. And then we have another fund balance, which is called our restricted fund balance. So what happens, like I was talking about earlier, when the state gives us money for like special education, comp ed, and uh, the other programs, you have to use a certain percentage of that funding and you have to use it within three years. And if you don't, you get to carry it forward. And, but you have to reserve it anyway because you can't spend that money on something else and then because then you're not gonna have it to spend on what you're supposed to spend it on. Well, in that restricted for mandated programs, we have approximately $4.5 million that is for compensatory education funding. So in this budget, we have identified $1.5 million of comp ed expenditures that we're going to take some of that restricted fund balance to help fund those as well. And these are one-time costs. They don't have to continue recurring every year, but they are important things like the, tutor, the uh, tutorials that we do after schools, it costs us about $650,000 a year. And so we take that out of that money. And then we also get the schools other money from those comp ed funds so they can use it as resources for their schools to buy what other material, whatever other materials they need for the students that are um, coded as the high risk students that, quali that meet the criteria set established by the state to be eligible for those funding, for that fund source. And then on the unassigned, right beneath it, that $4 million, this is the $4 million that we already have identified that for projects that were authorized by the voters that we can use bond money to pay for those roofing projects. They, and then we also, those roofs were also damaged in the hailstorm. So we're gonna actually use the bond money um, to, pay, to fix those roofs and we're gonna free up those funds and they're gonna stay in the general operating fund. And this is the one that I had visited with you all about earlier that we had spoken with um, bond council about this to make sure that it was appropriate to do that, that there were no issues and they said yes it was absolutely fine so we feel really confident with that number so using those numbers we're down right now to approximately a 4.6 million dollar deficit which is still not good but it's more manageable than that 10 million dollar number and we're still going to continue to work uh, through budget adoption to try to see if we can minimize that even further um, and as you all know there's some other insurance issues out there that might be able to help us that with that but we're not going to know those numbers before the budget gets adopted. It'll be something that'll happen uh, probably, I would hope, in the next few months, but not before June 30th or the 25th of June. Any questions with anybody on this one? What is our fund balance right now? Right now, our fund balance is sitting at around 39 to $40 million. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm gonna and that's and that's a budgeted fund balance. So once we close the books, we always gain a little bit, but that's what our budgeted fund balance is right now. Okay. The next fund, which I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Does I'm not good with numbers, Mr. Elizondo. That's fine. That's what we're here for. <laughs> so is forty million dollars the um, enough reserve that the banks? qualify us for having a certain rating? Yes. Is 40, that amount? Definitely. 40 million, when you look at the rating agencies, when we sell bonds and they look at what, you know, if you're a good credit risk, if you will, and what they're looking for to give you your report of, you know, whether you're, what kind of rating you get from yes. the rating agencies, $40 million is, is uh, very good. Okay. As a matter of fact, the board has a policy that says that our uh, fund balance level for general operating fund cannot go below 17% of our expenditures. And that's about, currently, that's about 34, a little, right under $35 million. So we're above the yes, we're fine. But if we're not careful, we can be in a bad situation real quick. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna continue on. The next funds that we're gonna talk about is the general, uh, the child nutrition fund. And this is again the fund where we pay for all the uh, breakfast and lunches for all the students in the, in the district. And that's the only thing this fund can be used for. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on this particular fund unless y'all would like me to, uh, but total revenue, I'm just gonna go to the very bottom, total revenue for 18-19 is anticipated to be around 12.9 million or about $13 million, as opposed to 12.8 the prior year, which is very close. 
Is it okay if I go on to the next slide? Okay. On the expense side, uh, we're looking at total expenditures being at about $13.1 million for 1819, which is a, a compared to the 12.9 in the prior year. Again, this is not a real significant uh, change, but it is a little bit of an increase. And so the, the, the summary for that fund is that we're looking at revenue of about 12.9, expenditures about 13.1. So we're looking at a deficit of about $193,000. We have plenty of fund balance in that fund still. Uh, and however, as every year, they do a really good job in the child nutrition program. And they'll, I'm pretty sure by the end of the year, they'll make that up. There is, I think this, this year, I think, is there a rate? There is a, there's gonna be, remember a few years ago where the federal government said we had to charge a certain amount of money and we always try to do the least we can. Well, this year is one of the years where we're going to have to come to the board. Uh, Dr. Fields will bring an item uh, at a future board meeting saying, I think it's 10, 10 cents this year? Between 10, and 15. Between 10 and 15 cents this year. So that's going to increase the revenue a little bit and that'll wipe some of that off. Even though we have money, it's just one of the requirements that the federal government has that you have to charge a certain amount of money minimum to be able to receive funding from the federal government or else they won't fund you. Okay. Debt service fund. And I know I went through that real fast, but obviously if you all see questions later, please let me know. Debt service fund is the fund where we charge our taxpayers um, taxes so that we can pay for the bonds that we sell, our, more, our principal and interest payments. And that's the only thing this fund can be used for. On the revenue side, uh, again, let me start, just go to that first line again. Because of the property value increases, um, we are going to see an increase in collections of about $3.2 million. So it's going from 33.5 to $36.7 million. And again, that's just because of the property value increases. Because we sold bonds here recently, you know, we, were we had told the voters we were going to go up six cents and then four cents and then two cents. Well, this has allowed us to stay, I think, at the 1.5 cents. So we didn't go anywhere near what we asked the voters. But in full, full disclosure, the only reason that didn't happen is because the property values went up. Uh, so much. Otherwise, we would have gotten up, you know, more more pennies to get to the, where we need to be. So, revenue for this fund for next year, we're anticipating it to be approximately thirty-seven point six million dollars. What it says there at the bottom of the of the page. I'm gonna keep going. On the expenditure side, and this just shows you what the principal payments are and what the interest on those bonds that are due to be paid next year. We're at about thirty-seven point nine million. On the next slide, it just kind of gives you a summary of those two numbers and it says that we're going to be under by three hundred and one thousand dollars approximately. We could increase the tax rate by a few decimal points, but we don't like doing that if we can avoid it, so we just use half pennies and full pennies. We'll make that kind of money in interest earnings alone to be able to offset that, so we'll be even by the time the, the year ends up. And in that particular fund right now, there's approximately a nine, I think it's a nine million dollar fund balance in that fund. So there's also a very nice cushion there. Again, getting back to the question that Ms. Pashaw asked earlier, the rating agencies like to see that that's you know plenty of money in case something were to happen. Okay, so this is where we're going to get into a few more uh, detailed items. Now, these are the staffing considerations that I, I'm not sure if that's going to be easy to see from back there or not. There's so much information on here, but we try to make it as large as we could. Um, but this is for Veterans Memorial High School, this particular slide specifically, and it is for adding the staff that is necessary for the next school year. And you'll see that on some of, the call, some of those uh, items, it says there's zero cost at the end of the uh, the last column there, and that's because they're moving from um, Judson High School. The, the particular staff member is moving from Judson High School because they're having less students, and so we're having to adjust staff at Judson High School and moving some of those over to Veterans Memorial High School. So for next school year, you can see that it's going to cost approximately $178,000 for the additional staff that we're actually going to pay for uh, out of pocket, but we are moving a lot of other staff from Judson High School to that school. And except for enrollment increases, um, that should be it as far as shifting people around unless we have some kind of mass movement from Judson or some other school to, to veterans, but that should be, uh, for now it'll just be if there's more enrollment that comes in, then we may have to increase for that, but that'll be it. I'm going to go on to the next page. This one is for Escondido Elementary School. Um, again, it's kind of same scenario, set up the same way. It has all the positions there and how many positions are going to be in the FTE column, and if they're new or if they're coming from... Um, some of those are, well, actually, all those, maybe there's another slide. Let's think here a minute. I'm going to go, because, yeah, there's another slide, I think. Let me, let me go forward a little bit. No, there's another slide. Hmm, on here is the only one slide, but I'm not sure why. In your packet, in the board book, um, there was another slide. Oh, it had showed a few more positions, I believe. Um, it had all the teachers that were moving from masters. 
uh, I'm sorry, let me check. The total that's on that slide is correct at $1.5 million, but it had um, 19 teachers that were moving from Masters Elementary School right to Escondido. So I think all the rest of them are correct on there except for, except for that. But it is in your board book. And if you have any questions, please, you know, look at those and, and let me know. And we'll definitely, and we'll definitely update the slide again for the next meeting um, so that as we go through it again, you all know, we'll just be able to ask any questions at that time as well. But in, as a summary, though, it's going to cost approximately 100, one, excuse me, $1.5 million for new staff for that particular campus. I'm going to continue on. This is the same information for Wortham Oaks Elementary School. Now, the way we're going to handle this school is that we're going to do sort of a school within a school concept for half a year. So we're going to have um, staff, mem staff members over at Rolling Meadows Elementary School. And then once January comes, uh, opens, and we have the new school, those staff members with their uh, students will move over to the new elementary school. But the idea is to try to keep the students that are going to be moving with their teacher that they're going to have for the entire year so that not like with one teacher half the year and then we shift them to another teacher the rest the other half of the year. And for that particular school, it's going to be approximately uh, $1.8 million. And the reason it's a little bit more at Wortham than it is at Escondido is because we're getting a lot more teachers from masters that are moving to Escondido that we're already paying for versus at Wortham. These are going to be, there's, uh, how many new teachers are here? Are they on here? It's not on, it's not on here. Same, 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 same situation happens as the other one. Yeah. Six. So there'll be, right, six new teachers on at this particular campus versus the other campus, which I think had two or three. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the other one had uh, two. Uh, Four, six, yeah. It says yeah. six moving from Rolling Meadows and then 13 and a half new. New, yep. And that's why this is a little more expensive because we're not transferring as many teachers. Okay. I'm going to keep going if that's okay. So on, on this particular one, we had a request to reclassify one position. Um, our HVAC systems, uh, our chiller systems, they're very um, challenging and the people that, the skill level that's required to be able to hire somebody, we were just having a very difficult time trying to hire people to be able to do that. And to contract out is really expensive because their hourly rates are exorbitant. So we figured, okay, if we can try to increase this by, you know, about $6,000 and hire somebody in-house, in that's going to make it a lot more uh, cost-effective for the school district. So that's what we're going to try to do first and see if that will, uh, if we can attract somebody with a little bit more of money. Um, Ms. Fischel, the the person would cover the chiller repairs. We have HVAC technicians currently who go around and service the air conditioners, but the big chillers, there's a specialty there. And the person that we had last, we lost recently. But what it's cost us in contracting out <laughs> is almost more than what we're asking for to increase that position, to bring in someone of quality that will stay long term and we won't have to contract out so much. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Yes, sir. Okay. Next slide. Um, these are the hold hires. This is that list, the same list that we've shared with you before, with one exception. Um, we have removed the TAG program from the list. It was approximately $420,000. That's why if you uh, notice that the number's a little bit different, so just be aware that that's, we, the rest of them are all the same positions we discussed before. Except with that, that's the only thing that's been removed off this list, that we're not going to restructure the TAG program for this upcoming school year. We're going to leave it as is. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Uh, for the positions that were going to be eliminated, um, there's a secretary position in the curriculum and instruction department that uh, Ms. Davis feels that they, don't, they can do without that position. Um, and so we're going to move forward with that, and hopefully that, that will work perfectly, and that will save us a little bit of money doing that. Is that vacant now? Uh, there's no one in the position now, <laughs> yes. And um, the other position that you all are aware of is a tax assessor collector that we, you know, transferred those responsibilities to, the Bear, to Barry County. We contracted with them, so we're going to eliminate that position because we don't need it anymore. Yes, ma'am. Does that figure um, include yes, benefits? It does, and it's a significant, and benefits are always a significant amount of what's in that number. So yes, it does. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Those people don't. The, those positions don't make that kind of money. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. And there was two positions. There's the one is a secretary, mm -hmm. and yeah. the other one is a tax assessor collector. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm sorry. About in the tax 
Um, in this particular uh, slide, and I'm sorry, Mr. Shaw, if you would hit your, your mic only so they can, they can hear it. Oh, but, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, in, in, in tax assessor, it says one. Right. But I, there were another one, but the other one we delete, uh, eliminated when that person left. We had already included that in this year's budget. So okay. is, that person was only So this work is, against. okay. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. Um, these stipends are the ones that are attached to the new positions that are coming on at Veterans Memorial High School. Either they're new positions or they're positions that we're now going to have because they're moving now into the varsity level sports and uh, the responsibilities as well. Um, it's just that's so it just corresponds with what's in our compensation plan for any one of the high schools for any of those individuals performing these types of duties. I'm going to keep moving. Okay, the next slides that we're going to be looking at are the the uh, monies that we provide our campuses and departments to operate their schools and departments. And it is, uh, we list, these are, we're going to do the schools first, and then we'll get to the departments real quick. <clears throat> but what we do with the schools is we forecast how many students they're going to have in enrollment for the next school year, and we apply a constant number to those schools for the most part. The, the, there's a couple of programs in here which are a little bit different because they don't have a lot of students there maybe, so we know that there's a baseline that they need. Uh, let me just look to see, yeah, like the Performing Arts Center, for instance. And we're talking about moving that actually under Dr. Fields because that's who supervises it. We're, because we don't allocate that one on, on student numbers, we actually allocate it on how much money they need. And the same thing for the JJ, the Justin, Just, Juvenile Justice Alternative Ed Program. We just put some money in there just in case we need it. But we try not to send students here if we can avoid it. We try to keep them in our district here in our, in our uh, alternative school setting. But, um, that's what the high school is. You can kind of tell whenever you see money, like Justin High School lost some money, that's because they're losing a lot of students that are going to Veterans Memorial. And then you'll see Veterans Memorial gaining a bunch of money, and that's because their enrollment's increasing for next school year. But it's based on the same, I think it's $120, $125 per student that we uh, allocate to the high schools. I'm going to continue on. The only one that's an exception to the high schools, and we've had a conversation about Jet with Jet about this, and we're going to, I think they decided and we're going to make sure is that Jet's an early college academy right now. We're funding them a little bit higher, I think at $140 per student versus $120, and we're talking about looking to see if we could bring that back in line with everybody else uh, and just giving them $120. But we're going to do some analysis on that to make sure it's, that they can still run their program with that, and then we'll come back. It's not a lot of money, but it is just more equity. <clears throat> the middle schools, the same situation. We um, give them X amount of money. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but per student, so they're all funded exactly the same. When you get to the STEM program, though, at Judson Middle School, they do things a little bit different um, there for this, at the STEM project line. So you can see that their learning is a little bit different the way they do their projects. So we do give them extra funding to be able to do the projects that they need for that STEM program. And as you can see, it is a little, it's costly to do that. I'm going to continue on to the next slide. The elementary schools, same situation. Um, here there are no special programs, so it's pretty much these are so many kids, X amount of money per student, this is what you get. Everybody gets exactly the same per student. What we do it after snapshot in, P, uh, in October, after the PEAM snapshot, we'll go back to all these campuses to look to see how many students they actually enrolled versus what we projected, and then we will adjust them for if we underfunded them. So if we gave them less money because, and because they had less, we thought they were going to have less students, but now they're going to have more students, and we will give, make up the difference and give them the additional funding. We do not, however, take away money from the schools once we've given it to them. Once they've planned and have their, met with their side base and come up with a plan as how they're just going to spend the money, we don't take money away from them. Elementary schools continue, kind of the same thing. You'll see Escondido and Wortham here at the very bottom just being added on there uh, for next school year. And Wortham, just to kind of when you see, and both Escondido, when you see those numbers, all their instructional materials to start the schools doesn't come out of this. We take care of, out of the bond money. We'll pay, we'll get the school fully, um, all the resources they need. This is just to continue operating after that. Okay. Now I'm going to go into the department budgets. Mr. Lozondo, I have yes, a question. Um, regarding the allocation for the schools, the high schools, middle school, and elementary, is there a criteria for what those funds can be utilized for? I'm sure there is, right? They can really be utilized for anything that, they, that the site based uh, committee with the principal wants to use, as long as it's a legal expenditure. I mean, it's anything that's legal, we're going to let them do it, as long as they follow the proper procedures for going, getting the pricing and So does the site based committee have criteria on what, again, is it just that broad, 
what happens typically is that they will we'll give them their allocation at the beginning of the school year. For instance, we'll just talk about Copperfield. We'll tell them your, your allocation is $60,000, $30 for next school year. They'll meet with their site based, and we require that when they submit that uh, budget to us that they submit an ag agenda for when the meeting and the sign-in sheet for all the people that were in attendance at that site based meeting that decided, okay, what are our weaknesses at our school? What do we need to target? And so that they're trying to budget those funds and allocating them to areas that they need to target at their schools. But they can pretty much, if they want to use it, you know, if they want to spend a bunch of money on the library, they can do that. If they want to spend it in the nursing area, in the social work, whatever they need on their campus, whatever they determine to be is their campus needs based on their campus assessment, that's what they can use it for. Obviously, nothing that is illegal to, for them, like, you know, they can't spend it on saying we're going to buy, I'm not even going to throw out examples. Anything that's illegal, they, can't, they cannot spend it on. Well, I asked the question because I remember when we were given a presentation by the IB program for Judson High School, um, Mr. Hernandez had kind of said, well, I don't need board support on this. I'll do it anyway. So he'll spend the funds. So I'm assuming then he'll spend money out of these allocations, these dollars? I'll tell you something. Um, it, the first question is, yes, if he's going to have, if he wants to do it, he can do it out of his campus allocation. However, because the board, and I need to go back and make sure, we've had this discussion a little bit, but I haven't gotten to do the research. Because the board specifically took action to uh, stop the program, end the program, uh, we can't, we, we, we wouldn't go back and start it without the board taking action to tell us it's okay to start it again. So before, now if the board had never taken action and you all just kind of suggested it maybe and we kind of looked at it and decided through the superintendent that yeah, we're going to stop the program, then that's fine. We could restart it just letting you all know we were going to do it. However, because you all took action saying, you know, we're phasing this program out, we're not doing it anymore, then we would definitely bring it back before we said, yes, we can continue this program again or restart it up again. So if they're going to do that, uh, we'll go back and research, and it'll show up on one of the agenda items in the near future so the board can take action either way, telling us to go ahead and proceed or not. And what, you're, what you don't see here is the most, one of the most expensive parts of that program are the, the staff, the staffing, right? And so that is what we're really committing to because to purchase the resources is not that expensive. It's all the staff that goes into um, providing instruction for those students that's expensive and keeping up their training and their, their stuff that they need. Uh, my last comment in regards to this allocation. Um, I know that we're working towards um, managing or measuring effectiveness of every dollar that is spent. Um, I'm wondering how the principals validate the effectiveness of whatever the site-based committee and the principal have deemed necessary for the campus. Is there a way that they're going back to evaluate the impact of that program? They do. Um, I don't see those evaluations because it's not something that we require for our area, for our budgets. But my understanding is that they do go back with the side base. And a lot of it has to do with are we having a hard time in reading in our, in our tests, if you will. And then they'll say, yes, we are. Um, that's an area where we are deficient in. So they'll budget money to do some kind of staff development for that area, buy specific resources for that area. And then when the, when the tests come out the following year, they'll go back and look, did we make an improvement in our scores in the reading area? And if we did, that meant that whatever we're doing is working. And if we didn't, then they need to go back and reevaluate and say, is maybe we need to change our strategies as to how we're going to help with that need in our campus. All right, thank you. Sure. Uh, is um, to that question that Mr. Uh, Macias was asking, is that what we get from executive summaries? from the element, well, from all of the schools, when they give us those executive summaries, is that how we find out? No. Those campus if improvement those, plans? If those programs are, it, are what they're like? Well, the campus improvement plan, the, the campus summary is just a real brief overview of that plan. If you look at a campus improvement plan, a detailed one, then they specifically will put on there, we're gonna use X amount of compensatory store education funding for this particular uh, initiative. And so, that, but you really, to, to look at that, you have to read the entire plan to get into that detail. Right. That's exactly right. When they're um, drafting their CIP and the, the budget always reflects the needs and um, issues that are raised in the campus improvement plan. Um, the majority of a budget at an elementary school is for copier use. Um, the clicks are expensive. Um, and then the budget, the, campus determines where they want to allocate the rest of their money um, to take care of any concerns that come up pr primarily through assessments that they um, use to determine where the students are.
I'm going to continue on if that's okay. Okay. All right. So next, I'm going to go into the department budgets. And here, um, we're going to go kind of a little section by section. It's broken out that way. But so the board of trustees uh, for the school board, you'll see that your budget uh, right now is exactly the same. Uh, it's, it's under oh, almost second to the. Well, depending on what you're looking at on your side, it's on the right hand side probably. Uh, column says proposed 2018-2019 budget. <laughs> And so you'll see that your, the budget is 85900 And now just for clarity's sake, there's a lot of things like our TASB memberships that has to be charged there. So it's not the board actually using all this money for the board. It's for resources that are offered through TASB and things like that that the board has access to, that the district has access to. So as you can see, it's the same number that it was last year. And I know that the board had some discussion as to whether you wanted to modify the travel portion of the board budget. And so we really didn't want to make that change without the board telling us, because I know some board members said 1,000, some board members said 2,000. There's there different numbers that were kind of put out there. So if the board will give um, Dr. Montoya some direction, or if you guys want to speak to it now and just kind of give us a consensus as to which I would like, then we can adjust it if y'all want us to adjust it. If you don't want us to adjust it, then we'll leave it as is. It's whatever y'all would like us to do. Current and, and currently right now, there's five. It's a five thousand dollar budget right now for travel right now. Yeah, I think each, we can cut it down two thousand dollars and not hurt anything. Y'all can tell me if that's kind of if I okay. I, I'm, I'll go with that unless y'all tell me later to change it to something different. I recommend a thousand. Okay. And so, yeah, I just want I want to keep it where we're doing this without getting into any kind of trouble. So, um, I'll yes, sir. We also talked about not going out of the state with training, too. I think uh, everybody else is making cuts on this in the district and everything. I think we can do it, too. I know we should, we should set an example. Of course, if you want to vote not to, that's on your head, not mine. <laughs> and so we, we can, we'll... Let me kind of figure out a little bit how we can best do this so that we can have some input from everybody. And if, or if y'all would like to communicate it through Dr. Montoya, and that way we can kind of have an idea so that we can prepare something for the next meeting, showing one way or whichever way y'all tell us to do it. We, getting back to the comment you made, uh, Mr. LaFoyle, is that for our staff for next year, we've met as the cabinet members and are going to propose that we don't have anybody travel out of state next year um, unless it's for a I mean, it has to be something that's required. Now, if students are involved, it's a whole different situation. Now, this is just for staff development. But if students are going to some kind of a competition that is an out-of-state, we're not going to hold them back at this point if, a stu if it's something for a student. But we're not going to let our staff just travel out of state to go to, uh, to staff development. And even within the state, right now, um, they're allowed to, you know, we pay for mileage, we pay for meals, we pay for their hotel, their, we pay for their registration. For next year, we're going to limit them to one trip, so an individual can only take one trip, and we're only going to pay for the hotel and the registration. We're not paying for mileage. We're not paying for meals. Um, we're trying to get them to come a little closer, not go so far away. So if they know they're going to go to Austin, it's not going to be a big expense versus going to maybe a Dallas or a Houston. Um, the only, the only uh, exception to that will be if a superintendent at that time directs somebody to go to a particular function, then that won't count against them as their one function that they can do. Um, and we're going to just kind of try it and see what happens. And also, they have unlimited availability to go to Region 20. So if something is being offered to Region 20, we will pay for their registration. There we will pay for their mileage. Um, and if there's a meal that's required, we'll do that. But typically, there's not meals required for Region 20 because they usually provide it as part of the part of the workshop. Typically, um, so those are just some of the things that we're trying to help with as well to try to get those costs down as to how much we're spending on on travel. Uh, again, students. Uh, are involved in any activity, we do the same thing we're doing right now. It's anytime students are going to travel, we will send them wherever they're going to go and pay for their expenses. Thanks. Okay. Well, I would just add that um, we have a, a relatively young board still in terms of experience. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm always appreciative of the conferences that I attend and perspective I have. Uh, obviously, I feel we need to reduce it. Um, I, I guess I would have to... Um, examine what those standard conferences would be that we attend, the TASB, the summer leadership, um, as, as a, a benchmark, and then determine um, how impactful that decrease would look like. I would actually be very comfortable to meet 
Renee and, and Mr. LaFoyle at 1,500 in terms of a reduction that I think could still allow us to get the training we need, but uh, not impact and still contribute to reducing cost. So that's just my two cents. As I agree. I, I think we could either go 1,000 or 1,500. And I don't know if Ms. Holmes, if you have our balances right now, because we only have until the end of June to spend. Um, I know mine is. I know you give them to us every month, every week, every month, or it seems like we get them multiple times. We get them once a week. Because then I think, like you said, we can look at the data and probably do a thousand to fifteen hundred. You mentioned that you're you're not going to be paying travel or mileage, I guess, for the conference if somebody goes to Austin. Is that the same for state funded? Travel versus federal funded travel? Yes, that's what we're proposing at this time, is that we keep it consistent. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Because what ends up happening then it gets confusing because they're like, well, how come that person went and I can't go? Or how come you're paying for them and not me? And instead of saying, well, they're federally funded versus you not, we said, well, we'll just use those federal funds for other resources for the students instead of using them for mileage. And I know we can't take a vote tonight because it's not an agenda. Right, item. right. Not, so I do want to put right, you all in an I, I awkward situation. So we can there, certainly but, um, right. look at putting that on our next sure. um, agenda. Sure. We'll do that the for the next budget meeting. With the numbers, with 1,500 decrease, and you know, show how much we have left in June after SLI, I guess. And sure. That should tell us. Okay. Give well, us thank, a little more data. Thank you for the feedback. The other one of the other um, agenda, one of the other budget items that's really under the board as well is internal audit, and uh, it's still there. I mean, we left the forty thousand dollars that was there this past year as well, and that's going to be a decision for y'all if you want to change it. We're going to leave it at forty thousand, but if the board wants to make any change to that, I just need to hear some comments and then we will make whatever changes the board would like us to make. And the uh, election cost, we do have elections coming up this next year. And so even though there wasn't, we didn't have one this year. Um, so that's why that number's up there. I'm gonna continue on, is that okay? Um, if you would just give some feedback to Dr. Montoya as to what you would like, and then he can kind of keep a little bit of you know, just kind of hear from you on that. We can kind of go from there. How much of that internal, I know this year we have the internal audit for HR, but prior years, do you happen to know? You know, I think. Has uh, it always been spent or? No, not always. Um, this year we actually amended it a little bit because I think the audit was $44,000. So we had to spend a little bit more than we budgeted. Um, prior year, I think we had some money left over, a pretty significant amount. But I, if you'd like, I can do a little, like, you know, go back a few years and do since we started budgeting because we just started this maybe three or four years ago and I can kind of tell you how much you budgeted and how much we spend every year. It hasn't been very much. So you can do it for the time that it first started up to now? Sure, because okay. it has only been a few. It's been, yeah, it's a relatively young budget okay. item. Yep. I'd like to see that too. Sure, we can do that. Well, I, I definitely can speak to this internal audit discussion for a bit. We've done, as you said, just a couple. The assessment of the entire district, which we paid, and then this one. So this 40000 that we have budgeted, you said we spent roughly forty-four for the HR internal audit. Mm -hmm. Is that going to come out of this 40000 or? Yes, it, sir. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, obviously, since we didn't spend all of our uh, funding for the elections, we have money in our board budget that we can just kind of allocate. Well, for, for elections, I'm sorry, for elections for this current year, mm -hmm. there was nothing budgeted because there were no board elections. Wh which, and we had budgeted though 85900 for that, right? Um, no. That line item that's at the top is not for elections. There, there's an election line item under ah, internal audit. I see. I get it. I get it. Thank you. I understand. Sure. Okay. And then um, my, um, my opinion on the audit part of it is that we, um, there's other areas that, that I'd like to look at. And, and certainly if we have at least something in that account, it enables us to take some action on that rather than having just to take it out of the fund balance to do something. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to proceed. Um, the next budget is the superintendent's area or the areas that the superintendent oversees. Um, you'll, they're there. You can see what uh, the, the largest line item there, then I'll speak to you a little bit, are the legal fees. We always start off with a budget of about 350000 I mean, before I think it was two fifty, and then last year I think we increased it to three fifty. As you all know, we make numerous amendments throughout the year to that line item. Um, I think this year... Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's pretty close to three quarter of a million dollars. It's been a very expensive year for uh, legal fees. So we just have to try to do a better job of trying to control that somehow. And the two areas that uh, we mostly spend legal fees on are have to do with employment issues or with special ed issues. Um, there are our biggest two categories. I think they're in, like in the 
I, I don't even want to say the percentages. I think you all saw an email that said what percentages um, they spent in those particular areas. Um, that effective practice, um, sometimes the superintendent will see something that he has heard of at a conference or at another school district and he wants to come in and, and try to do that here, have a consultant come in to help us with something, and that's there for the superintendent to use. Um, it's also for when we have certain UIL competitions that are going to be unique in a nature that we haven't uh, expended before, nobody budgeted for, he can use that, those resources, he or she can use those resources uh, for, to help with those uh, items. And the police department, you'll see that uh, there's a significant increase there, and the major reason for that is that they're asking for three uh, police vehicles, and so we can, we're going to go back and evaluate that and, and see if we can do something a little different maybe, but that's what the, the difference is there. Um, under business services, which is my area, the uh, first item there, the tax office, that line is still there, and the reason it's going to be there, and I'll, let me explain what that is because it's a huge number. There are two items that get paid out of that line item. The first one is the Bear County Appraisal District. So they appraise all the properties in the entire county, and then they sh charge a prorata amount to every taxing entity of what it costs to operate the appraisal district. Our prorata share for this year was... I think it was 600, yes, it is, it's up there, $627,000 or so. And so we are budgeting a little bit more than that because we don't know what it is, but we're only going to spend whatever they charge us. So at some point, if they come back and say, well, it's going to be less than we'll amend the budget downward during the year once they tell us what it's going to be. And usually they tell us like in the August, September time frame as to what our, what our uh, cost is going to be for our district. And actually, the other number that's in there that's, that's significant is the Bear County collection, uh, Bear County collection fee. Uh, Mr. Essie's office charges us, I think this year was like $82,000. And so next year, I think we budgeted eighty five dollars or 90000 just to make sure we cover that he charges by account, so much per account, tax account that we have. And I'm not going to go through each one of these. The other ones in here that's significant is, well, they're all, some of them are pretty large, but all those that you see, like the accounting, payroll, accounts uh, payable, the $244,000. That has to do with what we pay our annual, our annual maintenance for our finance system and our annual maintenance for our time management system, which is a chrono system. And those, one of them is 150, 160,000, the other one's $50,000. So that's the majority of that uh, fund, of that budget. And then the insurance, uh, $650,000. You can see that this year we spent about 431,000 on it, but we know that we've been receiving some information that, our pro that the property insurance is going up and we'll receive that in the next month or two as to what it's going to be for our school district, and we'll know how much of it we use. But if it doesn't get used, it'll stay there at the end of the year. It'll just roll right back into fund balance. And um, the last one that you see there is a loan that we see for some that we purchased for some buses. It's the principal and interest uh, payment for those buses at $350,000 is what it's going to be this next year. It's pretty consistent. That's year number three of a five-year loan. So after that, there's two more years, and that'll go away. Um, this year, we are not going to need buses. Um, the uh, transportation, transportation department said they're going to be fine. And one of the reasons for that is y'all have amended the budget a few times so we can purchase some engines for some buses that we had that were still, in the body, the chassis and everything were really in good shapes, but the engines had some issues. And so we were able to, to uh, so that, that helped. Why don't you change things up if they see it for a while? They can, and we'll have to address it when they do, depending on what kind of cr criteria they have in there. You know, right now, they... The old law was that anytime you purchase buses, if they funded it, you'd have to put seat belts on it. Then they never funded it, so we never had to do that. Now, if it's any 2017 model years or newer, I think, unless the board says that, passes something that says that we can't afford to do that, then the board can pass that, and we have to send it to the state to let them know that we can't afford to do that, and they have to approve it and go through that procedure of doing that. I just, one of the school districts I know did that just recently. I saw, them on, saw it on TV. Were you going to add something, Dr. Fields? Yeah. Is it? Okay, yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to go to the next section, student support services. And I, I really am not going to go through each one of these because it's going to take forever if we do. If you have any questions, please, even at the next meeting or if you want to send them to Dr. Montoya and we'll get you some answers. But um, the biggest one, the biggest line item if we look there is adult and community ed. And the reason that's so large is because we have the Adventure Club that runs through there. And, you know, all the after-school uh, kiddos and, and the teachers that we pay for the, uh, for the um, community ed program all run through that uh, number. So it is, that's the reason it's such a large, such a large number compared to all the other ones under his area. Um, communications. I said, if you have a question, please stop me or maybe go back and I will. 
communications. Um, there are two. This is uh, Mr. Linscomeria. There's his budget. Is that first one, and then the business partnerships, which is the second one. There, there's a slight increase in his budget for a new program that he wants to implement to help with public information act requests. Um, and he gave up a, a staff unit for this next year. We put it on hold, so that seemed like that was very fair to do that. Operations. Um, there's a lot of money that's spent in this area, but that's because it's a very expensive area. This is where we have all of our um, utilities are in here. You know, there's a $5.6 million budget line item that's, that's for uh, the uh, utilities. Uh, the electricity mostly is what's most expensive there. But you also see, you know, child nutrition, we have $7.7 .7 million. Again, that's coming from the federal government, the majority of that. So it's in here, but it's we're get, we have an other funding source for that. The buildings and the grounds, all the maintenance of the buildings, uh, transportation, you see that $1.8 million there. Um, I'm going to continue. I'm just going to keep going unless y'all tell me otherwise. Human resources, um, Mr. Garcia's area, decreases budget uh, a little bit there, $11,000. Post-secondary education, um, again, you know, the biggest ticket, the biggest line item here now, which is interesting, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to have said this two years ago, but um, is uh, the dual credit where you look at the uh, early college, it says early college high school, but it's really early college high school slash dual credit. Dual credit used to be on the line item right beneath it, but we combined them. So it used to, it was 676,000 plus the 70,000. Now it's, for next year, we're, pro we're projecting $946,000. Again, if that money doesn't get used, it'll stay there, but it's hard to tell exactly what it's gonna be. It's so much per student uh, that the uh, eight Alamo colleges charges us. And depending on how, what size the cohorts are, you know, maybe we can teach it ourselves on some, it just depends. So, but that's something, the number that we are using now to kind of project for that particular program. Um, anything else on here? I'm gonna keep going. Academic administration, um, large item, the largest item in this particular area is special education, $2.5 million. And the reason that's so much is because we have to hire lots of consultants. Um, to help us with the students that need uh, certain services that are in their IEPs that we can't provide either be typically it's because we don't pay enough money to be able to hire some of these types of specialized uh, teachers um, or therapists and so we have to contract out and it's very expensive to do that. Were you going to ask a question? No, we're good. Okay. Um, career and ed, career, career and tech is the next one's on here. Now again, we do receive for both of those special ed and career and tech, we do receive state funding for those particular programs. I will tell you that we do receive sufficient funding for career and tech, but special ed is way underfunded from the state. We don't get anywhere near the amount of money that we spend for special education. And that's not unique to Judson, that's just probably across the entire state. I know the neighboring districts for sure, because we've had many discussions about that. Continuation, uh, continuing here, um, there are several items in here that, like that $650,000 that is state comp ed campus allotments, and this kind of goes back to a conversation that the board had, <clears throat> I think a month or two ago, asking about when we put certain budgets out there for the schools to use. Sorry. <clears throat> for the schools to use because sometimes the budgets weren't being placed out on their campuses until November, December, and they're saying, you know, we need to really have availability to these funds faster. And by the time, we couldn't do that because we had to come to the board and do amendments, and so we said, you know what, and it's part of that $1.5 million that I told you that we have in the reserves for state mandated programs. Um, Nicole, our director of accounting said, why don't we put something in the budget right now and that way we can do it a little bit faster, just telling them we need it by the end of August or beginning of September so we can make those funds available to them faster. That's why it's showing here as one line item, but when we finish with it, it will be distributed out to all the schools to, for them to use for whatever they need on their campuses that have to do with, uh, with the uh, at-risk population. No problem. Um, and then at the very bottom there, uh, Mr. Witt told us that he needed, we needed to start budgeting for band uniforms for Judson High School because they're already eight to nine years old. And it takes from the time that they start designing those things and get them out, um, it's a very lengthy process. So we're going ahead and adding that in the budget here. I'd like not to have done that, but you know, if they need them, they need them. They're, they get, they're getting a little old. What happens to the old ones? <laughs> um, nobody wants them. Um, <laughs> No, the truth, truthfully, we put them in auctions. We do whatever we can to try to, nobody wants them. Uh, one time, I think we even, we, we had to put in an auction. We told somebody was interested in them. We said, just bid a dollar, bid something so we can give them to you because we yanked just 
give it, if you will. So they did it. They bid some just nominal fee just so we can, yeah, just so we could do it to go through our process to get rid of them. Yep. It's interesting. And you, we were even trying to think, can we get maybe some of these places that do like costumes? Can we like, you know, maybe they can buy the hats or something, you know, but we didn't get a lot of interest in that either. <laughs> but I'm going to keep going. They are, heavy and hot. they are heavy and hot. And they're very worn by the time we get rid of them. Um, continuing on this budget, um, the other thing, the biggest one in this, on this particular slide is that summer school uh, that we do for the end of course, uh, testing when we have to re do the re remediation for the students who didn't pass it. So we put this budget out here and we're kind of talking about doing a little bit different maybe with that, but we just don't always, we never want to forget to budget for it because it is an expense that we're going to have to remediate those students. Uh, for technology, um, they did a significant a decrease here compared to last year overall. Uh, but again, internet service, you know, all the telephone lines, everything, it's, it's expensive to do that. And that's what you're seeing in that very first line item, a lot of the, the things that we do there. And then desktop services, the repairs of all the computers and what have you, all the parts that they have to buy. Um, a lot of some of the service agreements are in that network services as well. So it's, it's just an expensive uh, little area to, to run. Curriculum and instruction. Um, here again, you'll see there's, there, there are I mean, some pretty large numbers there of nothing that is over the $200,000 amount. But if you have any questions, please let us know. and We'll have happy to try to answer them. That first line item, textbook administrator, I'll just speak to one thing on here at least. The reason that's kind of large is because the books that we buy for JECA um, are budgeted for in here. And so uh, Ms. Bellinger takes care of making sure that they have their books so they, we put the money here to buy those. On this particular slide, um, I guess the I station, which I think all, most of y'all are familiar with, $255,000. We uh, did have something that was in here that if you'll see that um, we were trying to work our way out of since last year and with Ms. Davis's help, we were able to get out of it this year. Um, that Stride Academy that was not being used, it had been sitting, you know, it wasn't used, being used to the capacity that we needed to be used. And we had a long-term contract with it, but because of uh, our purchasing director and Ms. Davis, they were able to talk to the company and they said, okay, they were gonna let us out of it. Well, actually we just had to give them notice in an, an appropriate amount of time and, re and reason. And so we're not gonna have to pay that $216,000 that was there, so that, that definitely helped. And that's it. Have any questions that I can answer? And if not now, I like I said, anytime I am available for Dr. Montoya to answer your questions in the future. And our next meeting, I think, right now, is scheduled for is it the nineteenth, I mm -hmm. think, is what everybody agreed on? I think the the nineteenth of, of June. Is that right, Betty? I think so. Yep. June the nineteenth is the next budget meeting. And then the one after that will be on June the twenty fifth, uh, which is a week after that. And uh, that is when we will actually have our public hearing to talk about the budget and tax rate and hopefully adopt the budget as well for next year. Thank you, board members. You. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm sorry, just very quickly. So in summary, right now the cost savings are in the HVAC maintenance department operations. We, we were given uh, recommendations on how we could save in that area and what else well what happened when we discussed the um, HVAC situation it didn't go over very well if you remember uh, because uh, some board, some of the board members felt like it was going to be uh, too hot the set points were too high and our work our custodians were going to be uh, not able to work comfortably in those uh, temperatures and so um, Dr. Fields, uh, with that feedback from the board, went back and spoke, had a meeting with the, uh, all the head custodians mm -hmm. and said, okay, how about if we do something a little bit different? We don't go to 85 degrees. Um, what, what is something that's tolerable that you guys can work with and be comfortable with? So they decided with 80 degrees would be the set points. And that still allowed us some savings. It didn't allow us as much savings, obviously, but it, allow us, it allowed some savings. Also with the understanding that if the custodians were gonna be working in a particular area and it was gonna get, you know, it was getting too hot, they had the ability to contact the energy management department and say, hey, can you give us a little bit more air in this area because it was just too hot today. And they would do that for them to make sure that they were comfortable working in that area while they were cleaning that particular area. And also there would be a rescue room to go to that would Yes, I don't, are they still gonna do that cold down room, cool room? 
the, the head custodians recommended that we not do that. They felt like if they're working in the B wing, and the S wing is at 80, but we've turned down the B wing to 75, that's where they're gonna eat. There's no reason for a rescue room because they're, they're gonna be comfortable wherever they're working, so. Our, sure, our, our major savings is really in the hold of the, uh, the, the positions. It's in personnel, and that's and, and in the school district, that's typically where you're going to find the major savings, because that's where we have our major. That's where our expenses go. So it's going to be in trying to hold uh, the hiring in as many positions as we can, because, and I've mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again. Next school year, 1819, not 1819. I'm sorry, 1920, uh, unless the state does something very meaningful, which that's all relative speaking. So I think the state hopefully will do something, but I don't think it's going to be enough to help many, many school districts. So I'm, I'm thinking that at some point, the boards will have to be going to the taxpayers for tax ratification elections because we have cut so much that it's, you can, there's maybe a few more things, but now you're actually gonna be cutting people um, and, uh, and programs, and programs that are gonna be, unfortunately, that could directly impact um, student. our students uh, education right so it is going to get it is going to get tougher as uh, as the years go on unless the state does something like I said very meaningful and to them they may be meaningful but you know the state also only has so much money to go around and so when they can tell Judson hey we'll give you four million dollars and that's a lot of money but when we're in the hole you know 10 to 13 million dollars 15 million dollars that's not going to take care of the problem so we've got two million on hold higher oh. two million on hold hires and then 138,000 on eliminated positions. Mm -hmm. Approximately, All right. But, and so the other big pieces are, is the insurance, that we're gonna get $4 million uh, that we've already identified that, and that is the biggest piece uh, of this particular year. Like I said earlier, if we didn't have that happen this year, we were just fortunate that that uh, was something that we, that we had the bond funds to do that and we were having this insurance. If it wouldn't have been for that, we would have, I, I, would have had to recommend, the board didn't have to do it obviously, but I would have to recommend it that we have to go for a tax ratification election and do and go to the voters and ask them to increase our tax rate because you can't take that much of a hit to our fund balance. Last year we started off with a little surplus, or this current year we're in right now, we started off with a little maybe under $200,000 surplus that we had projected, mm -hmm. but then we decided, okay, let's go and give, the, give our employees uh, a pay raise, which then put us in a four, right. almost $5 million deficit situation. Right. And like I said, you can do that with our fund balance for a year or so, but after that, you have to self-correct. You have to correct, you have to, or else it's gonna get you in a bad situation. So now we've gone from the 10 million to what? Four? Now we're down to 4.6 million. Okay, all right, thank you, Ms. Dellis. Thank you, Mr. Elizondo. Yeah, I'm sorry, say, but that's an artif that's a artificial, that's for, right, it's a one-time thing, right. That's ballpark. Well, and, it's, I, and what I guess I'm saying is that next year, if nothing were to change and everything were to stay the same and you didn't have that dollars, you would be in a $10 million deficit. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Sure. Okay, a, few, a few comments. Um, the 17% that we are bound to for our fund balance, is that based on the hundred and I mean, salaries and benefits, or is that based on total expenditures? What is that 17% based on? It's based on total expenditures. So 192,000 from last year? Sure, and, that's, and that, so that number changes all the time, right? Because as your expenditures go up, the fund balance requirement goes up. Now, I wanna be real clear that that 17% is something that our board adopted. Not all boards do that. Um, and the reason we did that, there's a couple of reasons, is that depending on who you, who you speak with, they'll tell you that it's good to have between a two and three month uh, expenditures in your savings account and your fund balance. And so the 17% is kind of right there and we felt like that was a good number to use. And it will, like I said, as your expenditures change every year, if they go up or down, then that requirement's gonna go up and down. But the board could have very easily said, I want it to be a 12% or I want it to be a 25%. Sure. So there is some flexibility there if the board wanted to do that. It's just 17 is a, is a, it's a good, it's a, it really is a good number to be at. Well, it certainly would be somewhere we'd like to be, but um, obviously things are getting very challenging for us. So anyway, just thank you for the clarity. The other thought is that we have um, obviously these new schools that are opening up at Escondido North and, and Wortham Oaks, but 
again, you did not forecast for any increased enrollment just so that we could have something to have as a target. But again, my expectation is eventually we would, we would see, with developments in those areas, increased enrollment, which again means increased revenue. Would, would that be safe to say? D yes, definitely. Uh, and as well with that comes in increased expenditures. So if we have more students that show up at our schools, we will generate more revenue, but we will also generate more expenditures because we will need more teachers uh, to be able to teach those students. But you're right in that. Uh, for the, because what we've seen, we, we would, in the past, prior to two years ago, we would always project a 1% to 2% enrollment increase. Um, but because of what's been happening for the past two years, um, I haven't done that because we have been losing students instead of gaining students. And um, I am eager to have dialogue in August regarding the HR audit. So um, it'll be helpful, but I have a question in regards to uh, efficiency. I didn't see a recommendation for a reduction in days for any of the coordinator positions, cabinet members, or any of that in this discussion. And I think we had asked for some sort of assessment of what that value would look like for us to discuss. So where is that information or when can we expect to see it? I'll bring it to the next meeting. We did discuss it as cabinet. We kind of run a bunch of numbers and I kind of shared with you at the last meeting that one of our, um, one of the complications is was trying to determine, okay, who are we gonna affect? Are we gonna affect the custodians? And, you know, every, because originally we were talking about everybody who worked 200, year round, if you will. 226. Or above, right? So our custodians work 260 days, our maintenance people work to, uh, 240 days. We have, so we have different schedules. So is it trying to affect everybody and say, we're gonna cut everybody that much? So did we really wanna go and cut a custodian's pay? Or did we really wanna go cut a, Main employee, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where we started running into complexity, saying, okay, do we then go back and just say the cabinet members? Only the cabinet members are going to be cut, you know, X number of days. And when we looked at it, it's like, well, you're talking, if we just do the cabinet members, you're talking ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for all the cabinet members, not just one cabinet member, if you cut them back two or three days. And it's like, well, is that what's that really going to accomplish? Um, and so we just kind of felt like, I know I was one of the cabinet members that said, even though I'm not going to be here during that whole time, I thought, that's not really gonna be as impactful as we would like it to be. And as you're cutting more staff, more support staff, those people that are in charge need to do more work because they're not gonna have anybody down, a little bit further down to say, I wanna delegate this to you. No, you're gonna have to do it yourself because nobody's gonna be here to delegate it to. So it was like, it, didn't, it just didn't make sense to do it, but I don't want that to see, feel like, or to come across as we're not willing to do that. If you can give us some information on, or some ideas through Dr. Montoya about, we would like to see how much it would uh, cost, how much it would save us to do the following, like X number of days for employees at a certain level or what have you, we can definitely run the numbers. That's not a problem. Well, I, I thought we had given some kind of discussion on that, but obviously we can revisit with Dr. Montoya on that assessment. But to give you an example, if we did cut our board budget, $1,500 each board member, you're looking at $10,800 in reduced fees, which is, again, our, our sacrifice as well. Um, and what I'm looking for is, um, what does TASB recommend that our coordinators work in terms of days? Are we above that recommendation? If we are, there is something to validate, reducing coordinators by two days or reducing any area. Sure. Ideally, personally, what I'm looking for are the uh, positions that are, are 60,000 plus in terms of a day or two. We don't want to impact anyone's livelihood, but certainly want to um, examine that potential sure. Um, well, so that's just my thought. So we can we can definitely look at what other districts do as far as positions, maybe like positions and how, how many days they hire them for versus what we do. There are some that do, like some of the 226 day people here, they do them for 230 days. Some of them get paid, they just do different things. They pay them for holidays, they pay them for different things. But I wanna just clear something up. When you said that the board took a $1,500 uh, adjustment to their travel, that's still a travel budget. That's not take home pay. I so, understand. And so that's, that that's why I'm sensitive so to that. When we're saying we don't want to affect people's, uh, you know, how they're living or their bills, when we're cutting days, that's exactly what we're doing. And well, so I just want to be real clear about that, that that's what's going to happen. And, and I totally understand that. So if we look at one day or two, I'm thinking that's, that's minimal. That's, that's my opinion. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what we'll discuss as we, we go through that. Uh, but we haven't seen it, so I, I don't know what that even looks like. I know we've requested it. Um, and the other thing that um, 
if you have TASB, give some sort of direction on what days are looking like. Um, that'll be helpful. But that also will quantify why we won't reduce days or, or any of those things. But I haven't seen that as well. So I just want to make sure you guys are doing, doing your work in that respect. But when we're holding these other positions and we have a freeze on them, what does that potential impact have? And, and I say that because if we burden other employees with that workload, um, will they be efficient? I, mean, so I want to know if there's a study on what that impact would be by keeping, um, keeping a hold on that. Um, what I don't want to see is, is potential grievances, because as you said, we're having an increase in employee-related grievances that are increasing our legal cost. And if, if we're spending close to 700000 this year, I mean, that's, that's 350000 more than what we allocated in the budget. Could we have just allocated it to keep those positions going? I, I, just a, a thought. I'm not saying that we do that, but there is definitely some impact on on freezing things. And uh, I just want to know that we've we've thought through that, and we know that the liability is quite minimal if we don't have as many bus drivers or if we have less custodians and so forth. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And I just want to reassure you that you know the positions that we're freezing, we need those positions. That's why they're there. Um, that, that's not why they're not being recommended to be eliminated permanently, uh, because we're trying to, you know, figure out how can we make this work because we have a $10 million deficit right now, and if we wouldn't be for those positions, we'd be in a 12 to almost $13 million deficit. And so that bottom line when I said, you know, we're at 4.6, we would really be more at like 6 to $7 million deficit. Um, so I can totally appreciate what you're saying, and you're right. It is going to burden other people that are going to be here because that's just what's going to happen when you don't hire certain positions and somebody else is going to have to pick up the slack or that particular work that was being done isn't going to be done or it's not going to be done as uh, effectively as it was being done when we had the other staff members. You, you're 100% right about that, but the bottom line is that we're trying to maintain as many employees as we can uh, without having any kind of layoffs or anything like that um, and trying to do it with the resources that we have available to us. That's really just the bottom line. And, and I understand that, too. Um, but if you can get that work, at least I'll know we, we looked at its impact and we minimized liability. Thank you. If you could get us the, the most recent TASB survey that will show the number of days, I think that will help us. Um, and also we need to keep in mind, I think we discussed this before, where my personal opinion is I prefer not to reduce someone's salary. If we don't have to, especially because we don't know how insurance costs are going to increase, which is then going to be another decrease. In their, in their pay and what they're going to have to do. So, but if you can get us our the most recent TASB, I think that would help us. Ms. Kenoyer. Thank you. Um, hearing that we're already going to be effectively hurting these employees by not paying travel and food expenses when they go to these conferences, and and I know that as a uh, curriculum and instruction specialist, um, some of the conferences that I went to were to get very important information from the state about assessments and how they were changing and how they were looking. Um, that's taking money out of their pocket already. And so for us to, on top of that, cut days, I'm, I, I don't think I can support that. Mr. Uh, Dr. McCoy. Uh, again, uh, folks, and uh, it, it, it's a very difficult thing because the state is not funding at the levels they should, and it's probably going to get worse. I know that the governor has appointed a state committee to look at that whole area, but when it's all said and done, folks, for the next, I don't know, several years, it's going to get worse. The worry we have is that this coming year, this district should be okay. It's a year from now that there's going to be decisions this board or whoever's on the board is going to have to make in terms of either letting staff go or a tax ratification election or some combination. And that's the worry that I just want people to understand that, you know, it, it's coming. Other districts are absolutely facing it right now in their budget this summer. We're not there. We're okay for a year. But a year from now, it's going to be very difficult, and there's going to be some very hard decisions the board's going to have to make. And anyway, enough said. Thank you. I'll get back on my soapbox again. Um, our live streaming for everyone at home, and uh, I know everyone in here. Um, the elections this year are crucial, our state elections. It's going to be important 
beyond belief that you vote not down party lines, but looking at each race individually. Does this person support public education? Are they willing to do what it's going to take to fund public education? And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I will tell you that there is a website called Texans for Public Education. Dot com. Go to that site and you can see that they have analyzed every single race for state senate and state house. And they have examined the platforms, um, the questionnaires that they've, these people have submitted to determine their educa public education friendliness, um, whether they're for vouchers, which will directly take money out of our pockets. These are the people that you need to vote for. It's important. We can't have people sitting back saying this is not, this doesn't affect me. Everybody has to get out and vote to support our public schools. Um, it's just crucial, and I really hopefully beg <laughs> that everybody who's watching and listening will do that. Thank you. You know what's real scary about that, Ms. Knoyer, is that um, there may just be no money. I mean, the state also has to make some hard decisions on what is there, and and uh, I don't know if they can print more money, but I don't think they can. So bottom line is we have some challenges that so we need to work towards being efficient across the board. And if we could get, um, it's not pressing, but certainly it is important to get a forecast of what our budget may look like. Because last time we did this last year, you gave us a two-year budget cycle as a projection so that we can start looking at it as we said last year. It starts the day we pass a budget. We're looking at the next year. So if we have an idea of what we're potentially faced with as we look throughout the year, we can examine areas and, and not cram it all in May and June. So I'm certain with your information you have, you could probably give us a forecast of what that would look like. You know? Um, yes, sir, I'd be happy to do that. And, and just for the record, we kind of started a little bit early this year because you requested it and we started I think in February with the board kind of giving you all information. And I can tell you right now that for next year, um, if, if everything will stay the same, you know, the funding doesn't change, whatever, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to be looking at at least a thir between a 13 and 15 million dollar uh, deficit. Well, and, and and obviously the decisions we'll face then is what do our schools look like? Do we need to consolidate some of our schools? Do we need? I mean, there's all kinds of strategies, but we need to be thinking about them. And so a forecast would be helpful. I'm still of the opinion that we're going to see an increase in enrollment, but I do appreciate you flatlining our enrollment because it, it's kind of a hit or miss sometimes. But certainly if we can't validate a school being open based on enrollment, we, we have to consider it. And if we look at something like where the mugs now, and it's 1.5 million, I think you mentioned, in terms of cost. So, so there's reduction right there if we consolidate if necessary. Uh, not what I'd like to do. It's not optimal in any way, shape, or form. But we have to manage a district for 21,000 students. So uh, we do have to make some hard decisions. And I want to be ready for it. Just thank you to everyone. Um, I know this is difficult. I know we're all facing challenges, but thank you. And you know, our biggest, we wanna make sure we retain our staff because we have excellent staff. And so that's hopefully our goal and to always provide quality education for our students. So thank you so much for your presentation today. We'll move on to item 3A, pursuant to Texas Government Code section 551.071, <coughs> private consultation with the board's attorney to discuss district-wide facility assessments and property insurance related matters. No final action decision or vote will be taken while the board is in closed session. The time is 7.53. Did, Dr. Montoya, did you want to release your staff or what, how did you yes. want to? Uh, I think uh, cabinet uh, 